Thanks everybody for coming tonight. We'd like to start so that you get the benefit of the oration and questions, so bear with me. I'm sorry to interrupt your conversations. The first thing that I'll do is just say who I am. I'm Kate Orty. I was the honourable chair of the Missy board. Delighted to have been uh, asked to assume that honour, and now I do other things. Tonight I'm introducing the speaker, but before that I've been also asked to acknowledge country, and some of you will know that uh, that's something that I enjoy doing because it's appropriate right and it's appropriate for a sustainability commissioner to be doing that, apart from anything else. We are on Wurundjeri country. It is, and it's always been, and it always will be Wurundjeri country and Aboriginal country. As a country, we are being invited by Aboriginal people to accept their extended hand in relation to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Some of you, like me, will have submitted to the committee that's been asking us our views about how that ought to be done. Can I urge every one of you here, when you leave tonight, to think about how you might advance the Uluru Statement from the Heart for Aboriginal people's just recognition? I'd like to say about Wurundjeri people that they were here in this particular part of the world meeting with other Aboriginal people who came from all over Victoria in ceremony, in Congress, in conversation and sometimes in conflict. But what we know about Aboriginal people, and uh, Bruce Pascoe is only the most recent person to talk to us about this in his, cor in his book Dark Emu, is that Aboriginal people are champions and have always been champions of resilience and resourcefulness. They also, notwithstanding commentary about them, were of course constantly interrogating their capacity to adapt and constantly interrogating their capacity to be inventive. So we'd like to start with an acknowledgement of Wurundjeri people for whom this is country but also for Aboriginal people generally and we'd like to start by saying think of the Uluru Statement from the Heart when you leave here please tonight. You have tonight a speaker in Lars Khan over there, who comes to us um, here in Missy, having arrived in January 2017 as the chair of the City of Melbourne Resilient Cities. He's a person who brings with him extraordinary experience. As the inaugural chair, he's strengthening the role of Missy and Melbourne in particular as a leader in knowledge-based urban resilience and leveraging opportunities for collective research. And we'll be talking about collective research here tonight, hopefully in some of the questions and answers. Lars was previously a professor in innovation studies at Lund University in Sweden. He's an interdisciplinary scholar on cross-cutting various fields of social science, always with a view of how you think about that from the point of view of space. He's well known internationally for his work on regional and urban innovation. His research interests converge around the geography of innovation. Where does it happen and why? What makes cities and regions innovative and to what purpose? What's the role of innovation to foster place-based sustainable development and how can policy leverage this? He's published widely and he's published internationally. In 2017, he co-edited the book Urban Sustainability Transitions as part of the Routledge Studies in Sustainability Transitions. In 2018, he'll be the visiting professor for the prestigious UNESCO Bernard Maris Chair at Sciences Po Toulouse France. I told him I had no other language than English. <laughs> Lars has been advising various local and regional governments in Europe and the Swedish Innovation Agency and the OECD. We'd particularly like to welcome the City of Melbourne Resilience Officer who's here tonight as well. And can I say about what you're about to hear from Lars, he's talking about resilience in the face of the sustainability crisis. Innovation, is it a problem or an answer? Lars. All right. Um, I would also like to thank, uh, to echo Kate's words uh, and acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the uh, land of the Wurundjeri, and pay my respects to the elders and families. Um, thanks very much, all of you, for, for coming tonight. Um, thanks, Kate, for kindly agreeing to chair this oration and for the nice introduction. And thanks to MSSI, Mizzy, for convening the event. Um, and thanks, Mizzy, for being a wonderful bunch of colleagues, and the same thanks goes to the Resilient Melbourne Delivery Office, with which it's been a pleasure to collaborate in the past more or less two years. So full disclosure, um, speaking to the theme of tonight, innovation, 
Um, this is going to be a bit of innovation for myself, um, or at least it's going to be a novelty. I don't do public facing speeches very often. This is my first one. Um, and to tame my nerves, I am using a script. Um, also to make sure that I actually don't run out of time, which has often happened to me. <clears throat> so, um, my guess would be that um, some of you here tonight are sick and tired of hearing how innovation will save the planet. Uh, while others may have been drawn here by the glimpse of optimism and hope that is kind of carried through the words and the meaning of innovation. And I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint you. I'm not going to give a definitive answer to the question that I raised in the title. And to my PhD students, don't do this for your PhD thesis. <laughs> um, but what I want to do in tonight's oration is to make an argument that we need to reconsider how we think and practice innovation, uh, particularly in the light of the major sustainability fa uh, challenges that we're facing. So having arrived at MISI about two years ago, I must admit I became witness and also affected by a fair share of eco-anxiety. And surely federal government policy in Australia hasn't helped a lot. Amidst all the MISI's sort of science-based idealism, the healthy skepticism and the critical hopefulness, it has caused sort of a return of some values that I held dearly at the start of my academic career in chemical engineering. So in my transition to social sciences, I've forgotten most of that engineering knowledge and know-how, but I kept a deep respect for the engineering sciences and how they maintain an intellectual pragmatism. Thought, reason as an instrument and tool for problem solving and action. And similarly, MISI's mission is not just about understanding sustainability challenges, it's equally and perhaps even more so about addressing them. And this dual role requires a fair share of pragmatism, but not a pragmatism that is just about instrumentalism. It's a pragmatism that, care, that requires careful reflexivity. That's sort of where the social sciences and the humanities really stand out in Mizzi's mission. Um, the solutions that sustainability uh, requires are kind of causing new problems in their own right. It's in many ways sort of a, a, a problem with many interconnected moving parts. So reflecting a bit on my former life and being an innovation professor at Lund University, what Mizzi has been really sort of pushing me is to ask the question, why? Why innovation? Why innovation in the face of sustainability challenges? And going back to the time I was in Lund, I always have to think of David Bowie's song, Changes. We're supposed to turn and face the change, accept the challenge of innovation, look for the new opportunities, that are always coming with change and then create some awesome solutions and plan for moving ahead. But is innovation and change really always good? Or have we started to fetishize the novelty innovation at the expense of its purpose? Growing up as a child from the 80s, I remember well the shiny promises of new technology brought about at the start of the digital revolution. At that time, computers achieved semi-ubiquity as they made their way into schools, homes, and businesses. Video games, electronic music, and robots all fueled what became the zeitgeist of the 1980s. The term futuristic had a positive ring to it, and few people talked about future-proofing our cities, or how to build resilient cities. Even though there was a growing concern with runaway technologies, um, especially in the aftermath of the Chernobyl disaster, the 1980s and the 1990s can be characterized as a period of great technological optimism. And in sync with that techno-optimism, we also saw the rise of the new knowledge economy. Recognizing the fundamental importance of knowledge and learning for economic performance, economic development, education was propelled as a basic universal right, and higher education systems experienced a transition from elite to mass form. And this had a profound impact on my personal life. Whereas my father followed the tracks of his dad and started work life in the coal mines in Dutch Limburg, I was fortunate to go to university with financial support from government, actually. So I became the first academic in my family and experienced a fair degree of social and spatial mobility. I'm, re I'm really keen to retain that sense of optimism and the economics of hope that follow from this short history of innovation, scientific and technological advance from the past two, three decades. 
And it's really delightful to see that economics as a discipline is catching up. With the Nobel Prize going to Paul Romer this year for recognizing the importance of knowledge and technology for growth and economic development. However, hindsight should not be mistaken for foresight. It's like the old joke, beautifully captured in a French movie called La Haine, about a guy who falling from a tall building repeats and repeats over again, so far so good, so far so good, so far so good. Until you hit the ground, uh, the fall can be okay. So, modernity has pushed humankind not just to live in the future, but to actively shape its course through innovation, science and technology. But at the same time, it's created a risk society, as asserted by sociologists like Ulrich Beck, Anthony Giddens. And this is really also acknowledged in a lot of the thinking and practice around resilience. We're currently facing environmental and social risks that are not just an unpleasant manageable side effect of development, they are a predominant product of it, of the industrial societies that we've shaped. So in this context, I would like to use tonight's oration to question the purpose and the direction of innovation. We're all supposed to be innovative now. Innovation has become the buzzword that future-proofs our societies. But what if we're getting innovation all wrong? So, December 2015, the former Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull, unveiled the much-anticipated innovation statement, which sought to move the Australian economy beyond dependence on natural resources. And the statement was a response to a growing awareness that the country cannot rely digging up and exporting natural resources for its future prosperity, notably if those resources contain significant amounts of uh, carbon coal. Instead, the Prime Minister suggested Australia should transition from a mining boom to an ideas boom and engage with the opportunities that are provided by the knowledge economy. The general response to the Prime Minister's plan was lukewarm at best and antagonistic at worst. And this was a bit of a shock for me as an innovation scholar coming from Europe to Australia. Economic experts couldn't see the point of all this faddish talk about the knowledge economy when Australia has been experiencing 25 years of uninterrupted growth. So there surely is no need to change a winning strategy of laissez-faire policy. And also the general public didn't seem too impressed and kept sort of a, men, a, a healthy skepticism regarding the avalanche of innovations that the Prime Minister had in mind. And it seems also that the economist did not draw the short end of the stick. With the replacement of Malcolm Turnbull by Scott Morrison three months ago, innovation seems to have completely disappeared off the government's radar. To the consternation of the tech and the startup sectors, the Prime Minister dumped innovation from his cabinet. The portfolio has been entirely abolished as part of the new ministerial lineup. So, so the, the Australian economy becomes so innovative, we don't require any more attention from government? Maybe, maybe not, unfortunately not. Despite Malcolm terms of vision and the innovation statement for Australia, to be counted within the top tier of innovation nations, known and respected for its excellence in science research and commercialization, Australia ranks a lowly 76th place in terms of innovation efficiency according to the 2017 Global Innovation Index. An index that provides a ranking of nations in terms of their aggregate innovation performance. But there are more sobering statistics about the Australian innovation system. Australia is rock bottom, the lowest of the rank, in the 2017 OECD Science Technology Innovation Scoreboard on business collaboration in innovation with higher education research institutions. Universities and business are not collaborating on innovation. But similarly, Australia finds itself in the lower quarters for business collaboration and innovation with suppliers and clients, or business engaged in international collaboration for innovation. So there seems to be a real problem with collaboration for innovation in this country. And that is also the explanation for the poor performance in terms of innovation efficiency. On the input side of the equation, there's a lot of valuable knowledge and research produced in this country, not the least in a place like Melbourne, with a suite of universities, hospitals, and very sort of knowledge-intensive organizations. But Australia does not generate similar levels of output in terms of new, improved products, processes, services, compared to other countries. It's actually lagging very much behind. So translating knowledge to innovation requires extensive levels of collaboration. 
particularly across sectors, across universities and industry, for example, or across public and private sectors. What the stats are telling us is that Australian innovation system has a problem because it collaborates poorly across the board, at least compared to countries that are leading those rankings and in global innovation indexes like the Netherlands, the Nordics, but also many other Asian countries. And the single most popular innovation policy instrument in, in Australia, R&D rebates, is not designed to change much of that. It fails to situate and recognize innovation for what it really is. Collective and not individual action. Firms don't go about innovating by themselves. They do that in partnerships. And that's probably the change of culture that Australia's innovation system needs. To paraphrase the chair of the Board for Innovation Science Australia, Bill Ferris, during the launch of the last National Innovation Strategy last year. Well, it might be easy to sort of say, we need more innovation, but how do you really do that? Based on my research um, back in Northern Europe, on what makes cities and regions innovative, I suggest we start looking for a fundamentally different notion of innovation, away from the sort of research commercialization uh, idea that, that is prevalent in this country. Not one that is framed exclusively in economic or technological terms, not one that is only cognizant of the financial returns on investment, or where novelty or excellence overrides a proper assessment of what is really useful. As really very powerfully conveyed by a near future visitor to Melbourne, Mariana Mazzucato, professor and thought leader in economics innovation from UCL in London, we need to better acknowledge the value of innovation. Not its exchange value, not its market value, its use value. To take innovation beyond the buzzword or a techno fix, we should acknowledge that it fundamentally concerns collective problem solving as a society, with solutions that are relevant to all of society, not just to the, economics, to the economies. In Australia, and in many places around the world, still the key argument for innovation are largely framed in economic terms. Innovation keeps us competitive, it keeps us at the, cup, at the cutting edge, it creates jobs. My former home region in Sweden, Skåne, had a formal development strategy saying we want to be the most innovative region of Europe. My former hometown in the Netherlands, Eindhoven, praises itself for being the most innovative city uh, of the world. And also Plan Melbourne says we are positioning the metropolitan as Australia's preeminent knowledge economy driving innovation. But to what purpose? Despite becoming increasingly knowledge intensive, our innovation fueled economies are facing some intractable sustainability challenges. Social polarization is deepening, even in cities and regions that rank high in livability and innovation indexes. And we're obviously really struggling to stay within the safe climate envelope despite or even because of technological advances. On that note, let us have a look at the dark side of innovation. Is there something to learn about how to innovate well by scrutinizing some of the less glossy, the more controversial examples of innovation. Take, for example, biotechnology, more specifically, genetic engineering. Arguments that humankind is foolishly playing God have been common ever since research breakthroughs in the 1970s. Still, potential environmental benefits of greater use of genetic engineering have excited researchers and entrepreneurs from the technology's earliest days. Its advocates argue that accelerated use of genetic engineering offers the only hope of feeding, clothing, housing a growing global population. Skeptics, on the other hand, say that the financial incentives driving agribusiness leaders like Monsanto continuously push types of biotechnology towards an industrial model of agriculture that is too energy intensive, wasteful of water, and dependent on chemicals. If confidence has been growing as the, past years, as the years passed without any sort of biological Chernobyls, doubts have persisted about the long-term health effects from engineered plants and, and animals. And more recently, security experts have begun to fret that terrorists could engineer and release novel viruses, bacteria or fungi based on uh, genetic engineering. What skeptics at a more general level are pointing at is that innovation may come with associated risks and unintended consequences. And this is just the way that innovation works. It's inherent to it being a fundamentally uncertain and creative process of novelty creation. Picking back on the risk society thesis that I mentioned earlier, 
some innovations may impose unpredictable costs to society and their transformative nature may render it difficult to anticipate their overall effect once they're diffused. They're irreversible in many ways. To take a final example from close to home, the smart city. Despite its Promethean promises to make our cities more sustainable, resilient, livable, the idea that increased use of sensors and big data will improve our urban systems of provision is facing increased opposition by urban dwellers. Instead of viewing smart city technology as a means of improving urban life, fear over loss of privacy and the prospect of a surveillance society have become increasingly prevalent. And as a result of such resistance, popular resistance, various cities have been forced to scrap or radically rethink their smart cities strategies. Barcelona, for example, um, which gained the reputation of being one of the world's top smart cities, um, many of its gadgets, its smart city gadgets, no, lo no longer work properly. The smart street lights on the Passe de Mas de Rau Rora, which were put in place in 2011 to improve energy efficiency by detecting human movement, noise, and climatic conditions, fell later into disrepair. And equally, while the innovation district of Barcelona, at 22, is seen as a global role model, the Barcelona metropolitan region economy is failing rapidly into mediocrity on the European innovation scoreboard. And it seems also in other domains, such as the increased automation and the robotization of healthcare services, driverless vehicles, and artificial intelligence, innovation runs the risk of turning into a misnomer. What these examples have in common is that what we brand as innovative has turned innovation into a solution looking for a problem rather than the other way around. A key response to the looming threat of delegitimizing innovation and change due to its unforeseen and unethical dark sides has been the rise of responsible research and innovation, notably in Europe. Responsible research and innovation seeks to give greater control over the direction of research, technology, development and innovation and to, to a broader group of stakeholders, most notably the publics. Not just as citizen scientists, but as knowledgeable citizens or users of technology and innovation in their own right. It's integral to Horizon 2020, the biggest EU research and innovation program ever, with nearly 80, million billion, 80 billion, uh, euros of funding available over seven years, through a set of responsibility criteria that research proposals are expected to follow. One of the shortcomings, however, of, re of responsible research and innovation is that it is largely procedural. It remains to be seen how its design principles will be implemented. And a similar sort of sympathetic critique I have for EU's turn towards mission-oriented science, technology, innovation policy, very strongly advocated by Mariana Mazzucato, who will be visiting Melbourne later this month, or sorry, in December. Rather than assuming that all innovation is desirable, the mission-oriented approach seeks to warrant greater explicit attention for the direction of stating ex ante the societal problems that innovation is required to solve. Laudable as that may appear, uh, in principle, again, it's all about how this is going to be implemented and about which voices are asked to actually articulate the problems. So the EU is very much currently putting a focus on societal purpose. And that is doing that to a degree that is not mirrored in the Australian research and innovation landscape. Still, also the EU remains wedded to a narrowly conceived notion of technology-centered market-based innovation. Instead, I think we need to have a broader understanding of what innovation really is. It's problem solving, not at the mercy of talented scientists and heroic entrepreneurs, but a collective problem solving that happens in and across all sectors of society. There's no universal, one-size-fits-all sort of principle strategy for innovation. It'll be a messy, messy process of trial and error. Invariably, we need to combine scientific, technological solutions with expertise from the social sciences, from the humanities, and to that mix also the real-world lessons from practice-based knowledge and experimentation. So beware of anyone promising swift results. Consider, for example, the extraordinary success of wind power in Denmark. A small, a small country which is now a world leader in renewable energy. Not just in climate sort of action terms, but also in terms of industry. 
Denmark was an early mover in acting on the 1970s oil crisis and acknowledging, not ignoring, climate change. The early developments of wind turbines blended scientific expertise with carpenter knowledge and with farmers and grassroots environmental organizations also involved. New forms of partnerships were trialed between the private sector, government, universities, civil society organizations that led to so-called wind meetings, fora for knowledge exchange and the establishment also of a collective test and certification center for wind uh, turbines. The Danish government acted as an entrepreneurial state which actively contributed to creating a market for wind energy through investment subsidies, not just leaving it to the market. Overall, the Danes took a very proactive approach, being resilient in the face of an energy crisis and pursuing diversity of knowledge and cross-sector collaboration, and it has paid off big time. Similarly, Germany and photovoltaics. In part, this is, it's after all Germany, a tale of Vorsprung durch Technik, technology-based leadership. But it's also based on close collaborations between research organizations, manufacturers, equipment suppliers. And this technological uh, leadership cannot explain Germany's success alone. The German solar feed-in tariff triggered an unprecedented phase of market uh, expansion and enabled a large-scale mobilization of private investment for the production and installation of solar voltaic systems. What few people, however, seem to know is that the German national feed-in tariff originated out of local experiments to create a market for solar energy. Prior to the year 2000, development and deployment of PV technology in Germany was not driven by national feed-in tariffs, but by a mix of direct R&D funding, some small local initiatives, and two large demonstration programs, the 1,000 and 100,000 roofs program. Subsequent policy experimentation with local arrangement between grassroots solar initiatives, local politicians and local utilities resulted in the direction of cost-covering uh, payment schemes in numerous municipalities, mainly in southern Germany. And these local arrangements were effectively the municipal predecessors of what later became a nationwide feed-in tariff and sort of an institutional arrangement that has been looked on uh, globally as a, as a role model. What both examples show is that successful development in renewable energy technology both requires innovation and experimentation at the hard end of things, at the hardware, the technology, and equally at the software of things, regulation, collaboration, institutional and behavioral change. But what I really want to turn, draw your attention to is that both examples originated in profoundly bottom-up ways of, of, of innovating and, and, and experimenting through local collaboration and networks across sectors. While it may be tempting to look at both countries for policy lessons for Australia's urgently needed energy transition, there's a risk of rationalizing after the fact. It recognizes insufficiently that deeply uncertain process of innovation that were present at the start of Denmark's and Germany's renewable energy success stories. Strictly speaking, most innovation fails, and it fails big time. According to research at the University of Toronto, 30 through 30,000 new consumer products are launched annually. 95% of them fail. As a rule of thumb, the success rate of an innovation project is about 10%. And the more radical an innovation is, the lower its success rate. This shouldn't surprise us. Innovation is a risky business that involves a great deal of uncertainty, made up of technical, social, market, political, and other factors. This is why we have patents that seek to incentivize and protect innovators. But still, the fundamental uncertainty and serendipity that is involved in innovation is not really acknowledged in how we organize for innovation. Often, the usual investment logic prevails. What's the expected return on investment? How can we reduce risks and costs? What are the expected outcomes and deliverables? What is tangible about this? At this university, we often mention innovation as part of commercial engagement rather than as part of community engagement. In contrast, I find it very telling how in Sweden, the National Innovation Agency, Vinova, was a champion for the world's first museum of failed innovation. Now, having worked with this agency for over 10 years, I'm truly impressed by their willingness to accept failure and to share the lessons learned from failure. At the same time, 
Sweden is one of the leading nations in the world when it comes to innovation, and that is not a coincidence. Being such a risky and uncertain endeavor requires trust between partners, a high level of transparency, and a willingness to share and collaborate for good and for bad. It requires tough and honest conversation. This is why the local scale is important for innovation. But there's also something else going on. Innovation generates significant positive externalities, to use a bit of economic, economics jargon. Even if an innovation as such is strictly speaking failing, on aggregate, doing innovation generates knowledge spillovers that strengthen the innovation milieu uh, and characterizes those cities and regions that we consider to be highly innovative. This is very beautifully documented in the work of Anneli Saxenian on what makes Silicon Valley innovative. And equally, economic geographer uh, Michael Storper talks about the untraded inter interdependencies that are really important for innovative regions and cities. This emphasis on innovation as a local bottom-up collaborative problem-solving process brings cities and regions obviously in the limelight. And not the least in Australia, many cities are indeed running ahead of their states and federal governments in addressing sustainability challenges, notably in the area of climate change. Here in Melbourne, one of the most, in most significant innovations to grow resilience in the face of climate change is the development of an urban forest. This is one of the flagship actions in the Resilient Melbourne strategy. The urban forest comprises all three shrubs and other vegetation, grasses, herbs, fungi, growing on public and private land in metropolitan Melbourne. This includes vegetation within parks, reserves, private gardens, along railways, waterways, main roads and local streets, and on other green infrastructure such as green walls and roofs. An urban forest provides health, infrastructure, and amenity benefits to Melbourne's rapidly expanding population and contributes to the city's resilience through improvement of sustainability, livability, and community well-being, and not least to its biodiversity. Using state-of-the-art geospatial technology, Resilient Melbourne is developing the evidence base for metropolitan Melbourne's urban forest in terms of mapping, data analysis, and biodiversity indicator modeling. In the past, Various councils place different emphasis on the for urban forest components under their remit, leading to considerable fragmentation and lack of coordination across metropolitan Melbourne. With an explicit focus on the metropolitan area, Resilient Melbourne is bringing together many stakeholders from across mm, Melbourne, such as 32 local governments, uh, Victorian government departments and statutory agencies, landowners, land managers, companies, financial organizations, and community representatives. It's this wide group of stakeholders that has convened to co-design solutions to maintain and develop Melbourne's metropolitan urban forest by increasing canopy cover and improving other aspects in the ecological sphere. Equally, the strategy seeks to explore innovative financial solutions. Our research into the strategy demonstrates the challenge of combining citizen engagement with large corporates, elite universities, and governments which have a tendency to operate in silos. It also shows how significant innovation may potentially fly completely under the radar. Albeit not branded as innovation, Melbourne's urban forest is a very striking example of a nature-based solution to climate change. It addresses real problems and draws on locally available capabilities distributed across a set of diverse organizations. And that's why we need cross-sectoral partnerships to make innovation work. However, experimentation within these cross-sector partnerships is not just a success story. While new and successful collaborations are forged, there are at the same time numerous constraints, risks, and conflicts that are identified and negotiated in the course of the development and implementation of the strategy. At the heart of innovation projects like this are processes of democratic deliberation that involve contestation and conflict resolution, consensus building, and coordination. Whether innovation will be part of the problem or part of the solution in building resilience to sustainability challenges will ultimately depend on its ability to acknowledge and deepen the generative power of democratic societies for deliberative problem solving. This is not about bringing innovation to a city or a region, but it's about discovering and developing place-based innovation involving all relevant stakeholders to a problem not just those most knowledgeable or most resourceful. That's why I'm excited about working with Resilient Melbourne. It's not 
recognized as an innovation in the conventional way, but it clearly showcases how innovation is really about experimental, entrepreneurial, and collaboration in process. It's by levering its networks and partnerships with the university, the private sector, civil society around issues that concern people really, that cities and local governments demonstrate leadership and innovation. This requires humility to trial solutions with no guarantee of success. Bumping innovation off its pedestal opens up for a great appreciation of diversity in skills, knowledge, ideas and experiences that matter for collective problem solving. And also empowers more people to see themselves perhaps as innovators. In an age where many people feel powerless against the system. It means broadening up towards also considering indigenous knowledge and perspective. Not because it's considered more fair or politically correct, because it's enabling best social thought. Innovation can be at once creative, mundane, and conflictual. It happens by and between all people, including you. And this brings me to a final example, a personal example, that speaks to one of the most significant sustainability challenges that Melbourne is facing. It's extreme car-centeredness. And that is something you really notice coming from Europe. It's encouraging and courageous of resilient Melbourne to have selected the expansion and improvement of a metropolitan cycling network as one of its flagships and getting Melburnians out of their cars and onto their bikes is taking a lot of people out of their comfort zone. By way of experiment, and I'm not sure my wife's really happy about this, I exposed our family to living in Melbourne without owning a car. It did not take long before we experienced the first challenges and tribulations. Of how do we do our groceries? How do we take our kids to school when it's 40 degrees? How do we stay in touch with friends that don't live along the north-south axis, but that actually live east or west of us? As we experience also as avid cyclists, the roads of Melbourne are, can be very hostile for anything other than a car. It wasn't easy, but two years down the line we managed to find a way around most of those challenges. And this brings me to sort of uh, uh, some of the concluding thoughts. Sustainability problems are really wicked problems. They involve many stakeholders with different values and priorities and are difficult to come to grips with as problems change with every uh, attempt to address them. In short, they cannot be solved. They can only be tamed. Deliberation across many stakeholders is therefore key. Deliberation is, however, under threat as socio-economic and political polarization is on the rise. Recent work by economic geographer Andres Rodriguez Post from the London School of Economics has called attention for the geographies of discontent and the ways in which the places that don't matter have started to take revenge in an unmistakably democratic way. Not by deliberation though, but through the ballot box. His work has shown a remarkable overlap between voting patterns for populist parties, both on the right and the left, and the relative underperformance in terms of socio-economic development. Same goes for the Brexit provides convincing empirical evidence that uneven territorial development as a result of concentrating investment in economic centers in part justified to maximize output for innovation in dynamism and dynamic economies has started to create a significant backlash. It's not resulting only in growing socio-economic inequality but increasingly so in political polarization. We are losing the middle. There's a growing antagonism between the places that matter and the places that seemingly don't matter. So getting innovation right to improve resilience is not just an urban thing. It's very important for all places. Be it in the context of staggering growth and dynamism, as we find in places like Melbourne, but it's equally critical for places in regional Victoria, like the Trove Valley, that are facing the potential loss of major industry, as we are sooner, hopefully then later, transitioning to a low carbon economy. Let me just conclude with a few key points. First of all, we run the risk of treating innovation as a one-off event, a eureka moment of genius by a heroic innovator or entrepreneur. That's still the stereotype that prevails in most narratives about innovation. That's how I learned about innovators and inventors when I went to school. Especially, however, in the face of wicked problems of sustainability, uh, it is rather a process of continuous and collective problem solving. And the challenge that we're facing 
is how to monitor and capture the value of these learning processes. There's an urgent need to develop and implement better metrics to measure innovation in Australia within all kinds of organizations, not just companies, but also in private or uh, public organizations. Similarly, we need to lift our game when it comes to organizing for innovation. Innovation for sustainability requires knowledge partnerships that are transformative, not transactional. Innovation for sustainability will be a challenge in Australia because it's a long-term endeavor and it cuts across many sectors. And these are two characteristics that don't really stand out in this country. Thirdly, we need to better acknowledge the existing capabilities that this country has for innovation. There's a lot of local innovation happening which we fail to recognize, both in regional and in urban Australia. There's more than enough sustainability crises coming at us that will require collective problem solving. Being resilient means being adaptive, learning by doing and doing by learning. Even though we can't afford to get this wrong, we will undoubtedly make many mistakes along the way. But to conclude with the words of Yoda, the greatest teacher failure is. Thank you.